Vertical farming wasn't supposed to end with pink-lit warehouses declaring bankruptcy, but that's exactly where the hype train crashed. The power bills were brutal, the yields were narrow, and most startups were growing the wrong crops in the wrong buildings at the wrong time. Then James Dyson, the vacuum guy, rolled up to a strawberry field with a factory mindset and built something different, a hybrid glasshouse that treats energy, heat, water, even CO2 as parts of one connected machine. And here's the twist. By borrowing sunlight and recycling waste, Dyson may have quietly solved the two problems that killed the last generation of vertical farms, electricity and economics. Vertical farming's downfall wasn't really about farming. It was about physics and finance. Plant factories in sealed warehouses promised perfect climates and 24-7 growth, but LEDs and HVAC don't run on vibes. Peer-reviewed work keeps finding that indoor vertical farms have an order of magnitude higher energy intensity than greenhouses, often hundreds of kilowatt hours per square meter per year. One analysis pegs median energy use for VFs around 814 kilowatt hours per square meter versus 97 kilowatt hours per square meter for greenhouses. That gap doesn't just sting, it steamrolls your margins when electricity spikes. Add investor pressure to scale fast and chase categories like lettuce with razor-thin unit economics, and you get a wave of restructurings. Aero Farms filed Chapter 11 in 2023 before rebooting, Plenty followed with a Chapter 11 filing in 2025 and says it's refocusing on berries. Kalara also went through bankruptcy. The hype wasn't entirely wrong. Controlled environments do amazing things, but the bill came due. Dyson's team didn't build a sealed city of kale. They built a 26-acre glass house in Lincolnshire and put the vertical inside it. Giant rotating rigs and stacked gutters that move strawberries past the sun like parts on a conveyor. The facility uses daylight first, topping up with artificial light only when needed. Rainwater is harvested from the roof. Crucially, the glass house sits next to Dyson Farming's anaerobic digesters, the biogas engines that already power the estate. Heat that would be wasted warms the glass house. Captured CO2 gets piped back into the growing space to turbocharge photosynthesis. The digestate returns to fields as fertilizer. It's a closed loop that treats energy as an ingredient, not a line item. And it's big. 1,225,000 plants, lengthened British seasons, and tonnage measured in the thousands rather than the dozens. Let's go inside the machine. Those strawberry rigs are not vaporware. They're literal wheels, about 24 meters long and 5 meters tall, weighing roughly half a ton each. They rotate slowly so every tray of fruit shares sunlight evenly. Robots glide the aisles at night to blast UV light and suppress mold. Predator insects were placed pesticide sprays. When fruit is ready, robotic arms pick only the ripest berries. This isn't throw robots at a farm. It's systems design where mechanics, biology, and energy flow are choreographed like a factory line. Even the pack house is baked into the footprint to slash post-harvest time. It's more Toyota than techno-utopia. Small, iterative engineering steps layered onto a greenhouse that still lets the sun do the heavy lifting. If you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to hit that like button. It helps more people find deep dives like this one. Here's what's genuinely new. Dyson borrowed from nature's metabolism. Waste heat becomes fuel. Exhaust CO2 becomes food. Rain becomes irrigation. Organic byproducts become soil nutrition. The estate's AD plants generate enough renewable electricity to power the equivalent of over 10,000 homes. And the heat doesn't go up a stack. It's captured for strawberries. The approach mirrors research on biogas greenhouse symbiosis, where CO2 from biogas upgrading, or CHP, is channeled back into controlled horticulture for yield gains and lower net emissions. You can call that circular. Farmers simply call it not wasting stuff. Now, the hard part. Hardware like this isn't cheap. Rigs, rails, vision-guided pickers, and UV robots, and a full biogas plant are seven- and eight-figure line items before you even buy the glass. And although the energy loop is elegant, electricity still matters. If your LEDs or chillers run long hours, your EUI starts creeping toward warehouse territory. The economic logic only works if you pick the right crop. Strawberries are a high-value fruit with a short shelf life and year-round demand spikes. They reward speed to shelf and consistent sugar. Try this with wheat or rice, 
and you're paying premium power prices to make commodity calories. Multiple analyses suggest vertical farms are nowhere close to competitive for dried staples when you price the energy per kilogram of dry matter. Great for berries and greens, terrible for your next bag of rice. Can Dyson actually sell these berries at a profit? So far, the brand is leaning into premium positioning and national distribution, with strawberries landing at retailers like M&S outside the traditional British summer window. That's savvy. It meets peak off-season demand without flying fruit in from far away. The glass house originally launched at 15 acres and 750 tons of annual output. Engineering upgrades and expansion have scaled it to 26 acres and 1,250 tons. That slow, iterative scale, build a base, use the heat you already own, expand methodically, looks very un-Silicon Valley and very much on purpose. But is local always greener? Not automatically. If you heat glass with fossil energy just to beat the seasons, your carbon meth can lose to an unheated Spanish field trucked to Britain. The advantage flips when you eliminate air freight and swap fossil heat for renewable heat and captured CO2, which is exactly the Dyson bet. Studies consistently show air transport is the climate villain in produce logistics, and life cycle reviews caution that production method and energy mix often dominate over distance alone. In short, local plus low carbon beats imported by air, local plus fossil heat can still be worse than a truck from a sunny field. Dyson's trick is to keep local while decarbonizing the inputs. For context, the Netherlands has been the gold standard for glasshouse horticulture for decades, wiring greenhouses to combine heat and power engines, recovering CO2, and hitting yields that make field farming blush. Dutch greenhouse horticulture pumps out extraordinary tonnage per square meter and has cut emissions intensity through CHP and efficiency, one reason the country remains remains a top ag exporter despite the weather. Dyson's model isn't trying to out-Dutch the Dutch, it's trying to leapfrog the energy dependency by replacing gas-fired CHP with farm-made biogas and closing the loop on heat and CO2. That's a meaningful departure, and one governments mapping low-carbon horticulture zones in the UK are already studying. Will this scale beyond strawberries? Probably not to staples, and that's fine. The research consensus is that vertical or semi-vertical systems shine for high-value perishable crops, not cheap calories. The future looks hybrid. Glass houses that sip sunlight, intelligent rigs that compress space, renewable heat and CO2 from digesters or industrial symbiosis, and regenerative field systems around them growing grains, oil seeds, and cover crops that feed both people and the biogas plant. Digestate then cycles back into the soil, rebuilding organic matter while reducing synthetic fertilizer demand, add agroforestry belts and hedgerows for carbon and biodiversity, and you get something different from the farm-in-a-box fantasy, an integrated landscape that's part factory, part forest, part field. So, has Dyson finally cracked vertical farming, or are we just at the next bend of the hype cycle? The honest answer is that the physics haven't changed, the playbook did. By letting the sun and weather do what they're good at, and spending automation where it truly multiplies labor and quality, the model reduces the two biggest vertical farm liabilities, constant lighting and climate control. If energy remains affordable and policy continues to reward renewable heat and biogenic CO2 reuse, this blueprint can reshape off-season produce chains, starting with strawberries, without pretending it will feed the world's carb appetite. And if you want to know whether this is luxury farming or a food security upgrade, check the inputs, not the logo. When waste heat, on-site biogas, and recycled CO2 are doing the heavy lifting, those British berries look less like a marketing stunt and more like a quiet step toward a resilient regional supply. All the sources I used are linked below in the description. If you'd like to see a video on how Norway just found $24 trillion worth of resources ties into today's story, I dropped the link right there in the description.